The promise of social media fame can become an invigorating drug. It empowers you and you've not had power your whole life. She's become a local celebrity. I woke up with 100,000 views. So then I started to build this whole image. It's like a gangster boo type, you know. But maintaining that image comes at a cost. It was like my cloud with his cloud. So it was like this big thing, but I started to see like red flags. He was becoming more and more agitated. I said, what the? I'm like, man, this cat is crazy. What does he own? When you decide to prioritize your image over your values, you may end up risking it all. She even wrote a song about the relationship of her being Bonnie and him being Clyde. Some people, once they're out there, and it's too late to grab them back in to save them. I remember praying, like, God, if this is meant for me to die, please let it be fast. What happened to Bonnie? What happened to the ride or die person that you claim to be? The gun comes out and he shoots. I'm shaking so bad. And he's like, the devil told me to take this up. <laughs> March 2nd, 2017. It's Thursday afternoon in the sprawling Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Dallas is a very vibrant city, full of cultural and ethnic diversity. Dallas has always been larger than life. But at 2.40 p.m., the hustle and bustle is pierced by the sound of gunshots. This was in Oak Cliff, the southern end of town. That area is kind of known for being the higher crime half of the city. A local shop owner was the first one to call 911. He said after hearing the gunshots, he saw a young man lying in the streets, severely injured. First responders raced to the scene and find the victim unresponsive on the ground. They do all they can to try to revive this young man. They go to intervene to see if there's any life-sustaining treatments that they can do, but he's already deceased. First responders locate the victim's driver's license and identify him as 19-year-old Drake Easton Alex. Drake Easton Alex had already touched many lives at a young age. He was an awesome kid, full of life. This is never a dull moment with him, I swear. <laughs> he just, he's a good kid. He was a clown of the bunch. He's very athletic. He loved flipping, jumping off of anything, buildings, houses, cars, it didn't matter. Drake Easton's charming personality made him popular with the ladies. They're like, oh, Drake, oh, Drake. <laughs> they love him, though, because he's, he's so funny. Not only did he have his own one-year-old, but he had a child on the way. He was a good father to those kids, too. He stepped in. He was a good dad, a crazy one, but he was good. He's a big kid himself. As a soon-to-be father of two, Drake Easton was determined to provide a solid future for his kids. He wanted to be a rapper, but, you know, he was an athlete. He always wanted to be, a, like, a football player, a basketball player. If he wanted to do something, he was going to do it. Like, he would never be told, no, that you can't do it. Yes, the sky is the limit. But now, Drake Easton Alex lies dead in the middle of a city street, gunned down in broad daylight. So detectives get to the scene and they begin looking for evidence in the crime. That was the lead detective on this case. We just show up and we kind of figure it out as we go. They determine that Drake Easton was wounded in his hip 
which severed a major artery, and that's what ultimately caused his death. There were some spent casings. Those were 380 casings. Detectives turn to the witnesses at the scene, hoping they can provide more information about what happened. Unfortunately, the witnesses didn't see the whole thing. They only saw the aftermath. They heard the shots, came out to see what was going on, and found him lying on the ground in a pool of blood. However, the shop owner who made the initial 911 call has some good news for detectives. He tells them there's a security camera on the outside of his shop that very well could have captured the full crime. It was pointing in the direction that witnesses described the event happening. When detectives get their hands on the footage, it's just what they're hoping for. The footage doesn't appear to be high quality, but it does capture the murder. The video begins with Dre Keaston casually walking through the parking lot. He's just walking through the parking lot and then starts walking across the street. He's moving in one direction and he turns his head as if someone has called out to him. That's when another man enters the frame. It appears that the communications between the two were developing into a more of aggressive conversation based on the body language of the two individuals. Like he's kind of in the middle of the street and kind of keeps backing up, you know, and trying to walk off. That's when the other man pulls out a gun. The gun comes out and he shoots. At that point, Drake Heaston takes off running and he's got a limp. We can see him point and shoot as Alex is running just out of frame where he collapses and dies. It's soon clear the shooter wasn't working alone. The shooter essentially is seen turning and running towards the PT Cruiser. The passenger door swings open and the shooter jumps into the car and this PT Cruiser speeds away. Detectives now know that they have multiple suspects to look for before they can solve this crime. On March 2nd, 2017, Dallas homicide detectives are trying to solve the tragic murder of 19-year-old Dre Keaston Alex. I got a phone call and said, your son has been shot. And I'm just, heart just pounding and I'm crying and I'm outraged. She was just screaming, can't breathe. I said, what's going on? I said, Dre just got killed. She's like, what? It was, uh, it was crazy. Fortunately, detectives are one step closer to locating the suspected killers after reviewing surveillance footage of the incident. They could get a general description of their suspect. He appeared to be a black man about 5'8 and 140 pounds. They've also determined that he had an accomplice. After the shooting, he ran and jumped into a PT cruiser that then sped away from the scene. The footage is too grainy to make out the vehicle's license plate number, so investigators quickly circulate screenshots of the car online. We can immediately put something on the blog and on Facebook, and it just, and it takes off. Almost immediately, they begin receiving calls to their tip line. The police get a call from someone who identified the driver as an Ashley Coleman. When the police pull Ashley's DMV records, they were able to determine that she was the owner of a PT cruiser. As patrol officers begin scouring the city for Ashley and her PT cruiser, detectives begin looking into their new suspect. 27-year-old Ashley Coleman was no stranger to hardship. I wore my childhood 
coming up was, it was hard. It was four of us and my mom, she worked, but uh, you know, she was a single mother. I was a victim of sexual abuse. I encountered it a few times coming up. I think any time that someone places you in a scenario that steals your innocence, it's something that you carry with you for the rest of your life. It affected my self-esteem in a major way. I always felt like I wasn't pretty enough or I was too dark or maybe it's my gap or maybe it's because I didn't have a lot. As a teen, Ashley began to act out. I was in juvenile from 15 to 18, so I didn't experience adolescence. I started to express myself with music. The things that I couldn't talk about, I wrote about. And then one day I began to write and talk it instead of singing it. She continued to write poetry, which ultimately turned into her wanting to become a rapper. Eventually, Ashley worked up the courage to share her music online. but. Her positive messaging largely fell on deaf ears. I was doing motivational music, but nobody wants to hear motivational music. I noticed like I would get like 200 views or 300 views. She ended up having beef with another local rapper who was trying to tear Ashley down. But Ashley wrote a song about her Nobody's excited about anything positive. You know, most people aren't, not from where I'm from. And so I changed a lot of who I was and a lot of what I was doing to make it fit. The change in direction got her noticed almost instantly. I woke up with 100,000 views, like, maybe I should just go for it. And that's what I started to do. So then I started to build this whole image, just like a gangster boo type. Ashley's music became so popular that venues began booking her to perform live. I was starting to get a buzz in my city. Based off of this kind of new persona that she's developed, she's doing shows now throughout Dallas. Ashley was getting all this notoriety. She's become a local celebrity. And it was at one of her local performances that Ashley met someone who would change her life forever. I'm doing this one party, and this guy, you know, who's in the crowd, I glanced at him, and I thought past, like, oh, he's fine, you know. And this young man starts throwing money at her in the stage. So I'm like, oh, OK, like, OK, they, they fill in the song. I'm rocking with it. Back at home after her set, Ashley noticed a DM from her handsome admirer, Hakeem Griffin White. He's like, dang, I've been trying to get at you for so long, and then I throw a little money, and you finally like and hit me back. Ashley agreed to meet up with Hakeem for a date, and the rest was history. That is kind of where things grow and develop in their connection. He began to take me to do all these things that I missed out on, like go-karting, you know, movies. We would go watch, like, the little the airplanes take off, puns to feed the ducks. Before long, Ashley and Hakeem became one of the new power couples in Dallas's hip-hop scene. Every party we would go to, he was popular, so, like, everybody knew him, and it was, like, my clout with his clout, so it was, like, this big thing. Is Hakeem Griffin White the young man from the surveillance video that gunned down Drake Easton Alex? He matched the description of the individual detectives have been looking for. Police are shocked to discover that he's only 17, 10 years younger than Ashley. Soon, investigators receive a bombshell piece of evidence that solidifies their theory. Ashley and Hakeem are flaunting guns on Facebook and are talking about going to shoot someone. I say, what the? Look like, man, this cat is crazy. What does he own? 
put the guns down. If you gotta shoot or kill somebody, you don't need them. If you gotta put an image out just to get some friends, you don't need them. Everybody wants this bad image until it's time to go meet the judge. That's when they wanna cry for their mamas and stuff. He wasn't crying when you was out there doing the crime, so don't cry now, you know? You do stuff like that, you go kill somebody, just put the shoe on the other foot, we're right here with you. In March of 2017, Dallas investigators suspect Ashley Coleman and her boyfriend, Hakeem Griffin White, are behind the murder of 19-year-old Drake Easton Alex. They confirm that Ashley owns the same type of vehicle that was spotted fleeing from the crime scene. And Hakeem is a match for the description of the shooter. Their theory is soon bolstered by an unexpected piece of evidence. A video posted on Facebook Live shows Ashley and Hakeem boasting about a life of crime. The video had been recorded just a few hours before the shooting. The two of them are loading weapons. They were talking about wanting to murder or harm someone. This how I do things, bro. I said the bullets down to this one. I'm outside, bro. I said the bullets, look, I, I really need to be. You see, I don't want to. So I really need to be here. The video was like he in a rage and oh yeah and um you you flicking the gun. The gun Hakeem has in the video is a 380, the same caliber as the casings found at the murder scene. Detectives are convinced the person Hakeem is threatening in the video is Drake Easton. It's a hard pill to swallow for Drake Easton's family. Hakeem was a friend of his, but was a young guy that in my house I fed, slept, clothed, you know, so that hurt me even more. Hakeem and Drake Easton essentially grew up together but they hadn't been close in a while. I had just seen him walking, and I was talking to him and, you know, telling him how much I miss them and, you know, keep your head up, stay out of trouble. I said, what the f I'm like, man, this cat is crazy. What is he on? I don't know if they was on drugs or what, but I still can't figure out why would they do that to my nephew. Investigators fear that if they don't find Ashley and Hakeem soon, there could be more victims. We had covert units that were going out, trying to find them at these different locations. They're surveilling all known addresses. On March 3rd, police finally get a hit on the couple's whereabouts. The police find the PT Cruiser in front of one of the addresses. Investigators want to make sure the suspects are in the house before they make a move. They stake out the residence, waiting for Ashley or Hakeem to make an appearance. But as they lay in wait, another vehicle pulls up. It's a large U-Haul truck. A driver gets out of the U-Haul and goes into the house. That's when police spot Ashley Coleman. She and the U-Haul driver began loading things into the truck. Investigators suspect that this means Ashley and Hakeem are planning on making a run for it. We knew that they were planning on going somewhere because they loaded up a U-Haul. When Ashley and the U-Haul driver are finished, investigators trail them as they drive off. Ashley drives separately from the U-Haul. The police begin to follow the vehicles, the PT Cruiser in front of the U-Haul and the police behind. It's pretty easy to follow a U-Haul and not lose a U-Haul. Ashley and the PT Cruiser are a different story. Or we lose the PT Cruiser. 
With Ashley now in the wind, police hit their sirens and pull over the U-Haul for further investigation. So we get the U-Haul and it ends up being this homeless guy. He appears to be confused as to what's going on. According to the homeless man, he had just met Ashley and her boyfriend earlier that day. They're like, hey, will you help us move? We'll pay you, feed you, whatever. Thinking nothing of it, this homeless man agreed to help them with their move. He had no idea they were suspects in a murder case. After arranging for the U-Haul and its contents to be transported back to police headquarters, investigators continue surveillance on Ashley's address. They're hoping that Ashley or Hakeem will return before they flee the area. Around 4 p.m., they're in luck. They see a white car pull up to the house. Ashley gets out and goes into the house. When she comes outside, she gets back into the white car and they drove off. This time, police move in quickly. They hit their siren and instructed the vehicle to pull over. The driver of the vehicle follows police orders, but Ashley has other ideas. When the police attempt to stop the vehicle, Ashley jumps out of the car. She takes off running, and now police are at risk of losing her for a second time. On March 3rd, 2017, Dallas police finally have their murder suspect, Ashley Coleman, in their crosshairs. The police lost her once in her PT Cruiser, but then saw her again getting into a white sedan. When the police attempt to stop the vehicle, Ashley jumps out of the car and runs away, evading the police officers again. She just kind of disappeared. To investigators' dismay, the driver of the white sedan seems clueless. So similarly to the experience of the U-Haul driver, this driver of the white car had no information about what was going on. He too met Ashley for the first time that day, just after she evaded the police the first time. He's like, I don't know, this lady just flagged me down and said she needed help. So like I was trying to do the Good Samaritan thing. She said, I need a ride, my car broke down. The driver of the white car was able to give the detectives the location of the PT Cruiser. As Ashley and Hakeem continue to evade police, they remain active on social media. Hakeem and Ashley decide to take to social media in an attempt to defend themselves from the allegations surrounding this murder. They're denying the murder, any involvement with this shooting. She didn't shoot anybody. It's all her rap persona. It's all related to this character that she built, and it's not who she is at all. The drama behind Drake Easton Alex's murder grows Ashley's already substantial online following. It definitely quadrupled her social media following overnight. Now the whole city's heard of her. But everybody starts forming their opinion. Thanks to the couple's unwillingness to lay low, investigators stay hot on their trail. Some of our covert guys, this is their full-time job, right? It's just kind of staying under the radar and just kind of figuring out where people are going. And they ended up finding them at this motel. This time, police move in right away. So I'm sitting in a hotel. I'm asleep, actually. I had took, like, the six circles because I was on those medications at the time for depression. So when they came, I couldn't even move how I wanted to. She was so out of it, she didn't even have the wherewithal or knowledge to be able to articulate anything as she was being arrested. The arrests are welcome news to Drake Easton's grieving family. God is good. I just said, God is good, you know? So we ain't got to worry about nobody else's family getting hurt. It didn't ease my pain by them catching them, but it made me feel good that you're not out and to do it to anyone else. 
Due to Ashley's concerning mental state, she's sent to the hospital for evaluation while police transport Hakeem back to the station. When they first started to interrogate him, he denied any involvement in the Alex murder. You know, he lied for a while. I don't remember it being a real long denial. And then he was generally just more helpful. Hakeem admits that he'd known Drake East and Alex ever since childhood, but their relationship became rocky a few years prior. He just had this ongoing beef with them over just rumors. I cannot tell you what happened. I know probably two years to three years back, they did have a little fight. They just haven't gotten along since. When asked about his girlfriend's involvement, Hakeem downplays Ashley's part in the crime. He was saying that, you know, Ashley had no idea that any of this was going to happen. But obviously, you're doing this video where you're talking about killing other people, and then you immediately turn around and go kill somebody. Once Ashley is released from the hospital, detectives bring her in for questioning. To their surprise, she doesn't have anything good to say about her boyfriend, Hakeem. According to Ashley, the honeymoon stage in her relationship with Hakeem didn't last long. I started to see, like, red flags. He lied about his age, for one. He told me he was getting ready to be 19, when really he was 17. She's 27. He's 17. That's a 10-year difference. As time went on, the red flags became more and more bold. Ashley says the week before the murder, Hakeem got into an altercation with another one of his friends. He tells me, take me up here so I can talk to him. I'm like, OK, you know, they're friends. They just want to talk to him. Ashley says when they arrived to meet up with Hakeem's friend, the conversation immediately became heated. They exchange words, but it seemed like his friend is trying to work it out when really Hakeem is like on 10. And so I'm like, well, Hakeem, just get back in the car. And before I could really get like my whole sentence out, he shooting. I was scared. I was like, that's your friend. What are you doing? So he jumps in the car and he's like, follow him. I'm like, no, you know. So he slaps me for not following him. That actually was the first time that I noticed that he was being abusive. Ashley tells detectives that night was only the beginning of the hell she'd endure at the hands of her man. I closed my eyes and I remember praying like, God, if this is meant for me to die, please let it be fast. On March 5, 2017, Dallas homicide detectives are questioning 27-year-old Ashley Coleman, a suspected accomplice in the murder of 19-year-old Drake Easton Alex. But according to Ashley, she too has been a victim of the alleged shooter, Hakeem Griffin White. Ashley tells detectives that she and Hakeem were involved in an abusive relationship. She became very afraid of Hakeem because of his volatile nature. Ashley says eventually she decided enough was enough and tried to break things off with Hakeem. Me and him sit in the car, and I'm kind of like at the point where I don't want to be with you anymore. I'm slacking on my music, and you know, I just can't do it. But Hakeem wasn't having it. He flipped out. You know, get in my face and he headbutted me. I had never been headbutted before and it hurts. He broke my nose. He just went crazy. He just started hitting me, fighting me, and knocked out a tooth at the back and bust my lip and pulled my hair out. Ashley tells detectives after that, Hakeem suddenly hit the gas. He's driving, we're on this back road, and he's going like a, a hundred miles an hour. And this PC crews there <laughs> passing through these four-way stop signs. I just put on my seatbelt and I close my eyes and I remember praying, like, 
God, if this is meant for me to die, please let it be fast. Seconds later, Hakeem veered off the road. I'm screaming. So he veered off, and we go into the grass, and the car cuts off. So that was God saying, get out of the car. But at that point, Ashley felt trapped. There's a research that supports that. It literally is life or death. The most dangerous time for an individual in domestic violence is when they're leaving. It was like I was doomed if I did, if I did. So she's got her identity of the physical abuse that's happening between the relationship and her and Hakeem. And then she's got this other persona where she's a badass female rapper that she's trying to continue to propagate for her artistry. Ashley says the following day, Hakeem brought both her worlds crashing down. So when I go in the house and he's making this video, he's on there like showing all these, all these bullets on camera, saying like, yeah, this is what's going on and this is what I'm gonna do. Ashley admits she joined in on the video recording. So I'm like, yeah, such and such. I'm trash talking. I mean, I have this gangster group type of thing going on, and I'm already rap beefing with such and such and such and such, so I'm just trying to make it real. According to Ashley, after they were done recording the video, they left to head to her sister's house. I'm driving on the freeway, and I get off and I pull up on Bunny View. They just happened to see Drake Houston in the parking lot. And Hakeem tells Ashley to pull over. Ashley was on the phone with her mom at the time. She's like, I just had a dream. You need to leave that boy alone. It's either you going to jail or you're going to be dead. Ashley says it was then that she noticed what was happening outside of the car. I heard this guy saying, please, Kim, please. So I'm like, Mom, I'm going to call you back. Hakeem, he has this gun up in broad daylight, and Drake Keaston has his hands up. This had something to do from something that he felt like he wronged him a year ago before I even came into a fight. I'm like, Hakeem, Hakeem, he's not paying me any attention. He looks at me, but then he looks forward again. Ashley tells detectives that she's watching in horror as Hakeem shoots Drake Keaston. He shoots, and he runs back and jumps in the car and he tells me to drive. And I'm like, Hakeem, what did you do? I'm shaking so bad. And he's like, the devil told me to take it, so ha ha ha, and start laughing, like this evil laugh. The gun was still smoking, literally. However, Ashley claims she didn't realize Drake Easton's injuries were fatal at the time. Before I drove off, he looked me in my eyes. And I looked at him, I was just scared. I could tell he was scared. That look hunted me for so long. Following the incident, Ashley says she dropped Hakeem off and then she went back home, still shaken up. I go back to the house and I go to sleep because I'm exhausted. He's been taking me through. But the next day, she was awakened by a torrent of social media alerts. The whole city was talking about her. She and Hakeem were wanted for murder. My phone is pinging, bing, 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 bing. I'm bothered. It's because this whole case almost played itself out on social media. Sometimes when you put it out on that global scale, you don't know who is going to react to it in the way that they're going to react to it. And now everybody knows. Just know that there's a consequence to everything that you put out there into social media. And once you ring that bell, you can't unring it. March 5th, 2017. Detectives in Dallas, Texas are questioning Ashley Coleman about the shooting death of 19-year-old Drake Easton Alex at the hands of Ashley's boyfriend, Hakeem Griffin White. Ashley claims that she had no idea that he was going to open fire. And after she drove him from the crime scene, she claimed that she had no idea that he was dead. The next morning, 
Ashley says she awoke to a flurry of notifications on her social media. My phone is pinging, bing, 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 bing. I'm like, oh, something went viral on my page again because the things have been going viral. Well, it's not nothing viral, I'm viral. There's all these people tagging me in the police because they seen my picture, they knew who I was, because I was Facebook famous because of the music. When asked why she hadn't turned herself in, Ashley tells detectives that she was scared. I was confused on where to go, how to hurt, how to play it. We go to a friend's and he was so paranoid. And he's like, let me kill her and take her car. The girl who was helping. I'm like, why do you want to do that? And no, you've done enough. Like, this is ridiculous at this point. However, detectives don't believe Ashley is being entirely honest with them. She's trying to manipulate me. She's trying to get out of going to jail by saying that she's pregnant. She was not pregnant. The hospital is like, no, she has no signs that she's ever been pregnant. It's on her social media that she's putting out this video of them loading up the guns. She's actively, like, trying to throw us off by finding all these other cars. She's constantly asking people for help under some false pretense. At the end of the day, both Ashley and Hakeem were charged with murder. Ashley decides to plead guilty to the charges in exchange for a 19-year sentence. I didn't go to trial. I just took a plea deal because I was scared. I didn't know my rights. So I really kind of got railroaded. I should have fought, but I didn't understand it or the system. However, Hakeem Griffin White decides to take his chances in court. The defense isn't saying that this wasn't Hakeem who was in the videos and committed this crime. They are simply trying to persuade the jury to convict on the basis of manslaughter instead of murder. If he's convicted of manslaughter, he is facing a 20-year sentence versus a potential life sentence if he's convicted of murder. He had his head down the whole time. You couldn't even look me in my eyes. You couldn't even get up on the stand to at least tell me to my face that you were sorry. I'm not just anybody. You know me. You know who I am for you not to even tell me that you were sorry. Hurt me the most. Based on the surveillance video that literally caught Hakeem in the act, along with his recorded confession to police about his involvement, it doesn't take the jury long to come to a decision. Hakeem is found guilty of murder and sentenced to 75 years in prison. They view Hakeem as an individual who intended to harm and intended to shoot to kill. The verdict is bittersweet for Drake Heaston's still grieving family. Emotions was everywhere. Yes, you getting sentenced was a great feeling. But it still didn't solve anything. I mean, I still feel the same way I feel. It didn't bring my son back. What we are going through, this is a daily thing. A lot of people try to tell my sister, oh, it get easy, it get easy. It don't. His smile, I miss his smile. And him, period. That was my nephew, you know. My son was a kid. He was lovable. He was outgoing. He didn't deserve to die. So as long as I'm living, I'm going to keep my son's name alive. Ashley Coleman is now challenging her conviction. Ashley is currently trying to seek a pardon, claiming that she was a victim of domestic violence. At the end of the day, you always have a choice. It may feel like you do not, but that's normally just because the choice you have to make is so difficult. Choosing for yourself how you want to show up, how you want to receive love, how you want to experience life can make such a fundamental difference of where you go in the world. I actually wrote a piece that I wanted to say before we ran out of time. It's kind of a warning. I sit in prison because of a guy's weakness, abuse, and fear. 
We are not puppets for men. We are not their vessels to manipulate. Every woman that has been manipulated into believing that hurt is love, I'm fighting for my freedom and yours too. One finger can't move a pebble, but one hand can move the world. If you and your man find social media fame together, it might feel like an exciting ride. But love isn't a ride, it's a journey. And when passion clouds judgment, causing us to lose sight of where we're going, we risk completely losing our way. Clinton, Illinois native Amanda Ham goes from party girl to single mom in just a few short years. But she makes the mistake of trusting a wolf in sheep's clothing. She was intensely, deeply head over heels in love with him. And he sinks her into the depths from which she'll never surface. She did not want to lose Maurice, so she chose him over the kids. And later, in North Carolina, Teenager April Barber has been dealt a difficult hand. Having parents that were incarcerated for a large part of her life, she had to grow up extremely fast. But when she's seduced by an older man, the two will stand by as her life goes up in flames. She felt stifled. She felt as if, I can't have this happen. This is the end. People will kill for love. People will die for love. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. Born and bred in sleepy Clinton, Illinois, Amanda Walston is a hometown girl learning to navigate her tumultuous family life. She was approximately four years old when her parents got divorced and her mother remarried. Her new husband wanted to adopt Amanda, and Amanda's biological father just gave up his rights to her. Even though Amanda's father, from what we know, was trying to do the right thing, Amanda didn't see it that way. To her, it was a real slap in the face. It was a rejection. It was a resounding voice in her head that said, I don't want you. I'll leave you alone. The youngster guards her heart by turning her back on those closest to her. But as Amanda enters her teenage years, she finds she can't hide from her peers. She was 5'10", which is very tall for a female, and she was pretty thin. And she was constantly teased by her peers at school, from grade school all the way up through high school. Have a nice day. They call her stork, they call her olive oil, pelican. And I mean, I know that hurt her, you know, quite a bit. And I was trying to stick up for her. Each barb weakens her emotional armor, and teenage Amanda acts out. She started to hang out with a different crowd of kids who were actually using drugs and partying all night. And at these all-night bashes, she's getting a different kind of attention from the opposite sex. Because Amanda was willing to go further than perhaps some of the other girls when it came to sex, she became more of the object of attraction to the young men in her social circle. Her mom spends many nights roaming the streets of Clinton, searching for her daughter, sometimes even calling the police for help. Amanda's mom already was in a quandary as to what to do about Amanda, and Amanda's downward spiral was perhaps capped off by her dropping out of high school three months before she was supposed to graduate. It was shocking to her mother that she would go throughout school and then all of a sudden abruptly stop for no apparent reason. I'm not going back! The rebellious antics continue, and when Amanda is 20, mom decides she's had enough. We want you out! So she did what some parents do, which is to kick her out of the house. Do this! It's done, you get it? Because she felt she had to teach her a lesson. No! Now out on her own, she survives by working as a waitress. And through friends, she meets a man named Arnold Ham. What a mess. She thought he was a really great guy. And I mean, they just took off, you know? And I mean, she was happy. Amanda's sure he's her Prince Charming. And the next year, they make it official with a trip to City Hall. Soon after, she learns that their family is growing. 
When she found out she was pregnant, she was really excited. I know that she really wanted a baby. And I mean, it was just, I was so happy for her. With motherhood on the horizon, she vows to let go of her partying ways and focus on being the best parent she can be. And when their little boy, Christopher, is born a few months later, the couple is overjoyed. But during what should be the happiest time of their lives, their marriage is frayed. The relationship with Arnold ended pretty quickly. Right after she gave birth, it didn't really last too much longer. She ended up getting a divorce and, and moved on. Now that she's back on the market, Amanda is quick to fall in and out of love. And after three years, she has two more children with as many men. First is another boy who she names Austin, and then a baby girl named Kylie. But Amanda becomes vindictive when lasting romances with the fathers of her little ones don't work out. She would keep the kids from them. It was totally unfair. I didn't want to be in a relationship with her. Then she turned south on me. I didn't even know my daughter was born until two days afterwards. Holding her baby so close means the 26-year-old shoulders the financial weight of raising three kids alone. She landed a job at a mass melon company, and she was able to get a public housing apartment for low-income families. She's not looking for someone new, but when a handsome co-worker cozies up to her at the office, she has no trouble jumping back into the dating pool. Hi. He introduces himself as Maurice Legron. The 27-year-old is a transplant from St. Louis, Missouri. Maurice Legron was very friendly, very charming. He was a very sociable guy. He was very attractive to Amanda, and she fell for him right off the bat, and he for her. Things get hot and heavy so quickly that Maurice moves in with her and the kids just two weeks after meeting. Amanda thought she had struck gold. Here's a guy who was paying attention to her, but also paying attention to the kids, too. But not everyone in Amanda's close circle of friends is happy about their fast track to romance. She always asked me, what do you think about him? And I'm like, I don't like him. I don't think he's it. Amanda will learn on her own that inviting Maurice into her home is the worst mistake of her life and the lives of her children. She will stop at nothing to make sure that relationship lasts forever, even if that was without her children. After years of failed relationships, in Clinton, Illinois, 26-year-old single mom Amanda Ham has finally found her match in new boyfriend, 27-year-old Maurice Legron. After two whirlwind weeks, he moves in with Amanda and her three children. Amanda was enamored by him, and she was intensely, deeply head over heels in love with him. With their challenging childhoods, the two share a common bond. His mother was a cocaine addict, and she didn't take really good care of him. In fact, he bounced around from house to house, living with different relatives. Over the next year, they live together, and he becomes a pseudo-stepfather to six-year-old Christopher, three-year-old Austin, and little sister Kylie, who is months from her second birthday. Amanda was overjoyed when Maurice volunteered to watch her children, but his parenting skills were no better than what he had experienced in his own home with his mother, and so he didn't have the foundation to take care of Amanda's kids in any productive kind of way. It was a chance to stay home all day, smoke blunts, play video games, and pretend to care for the three children. He didn't want to work. It's like, man, I can smell pot. I know it. Don't do it around the kids. Those kids need to be protected, and that's not the environment they need to be in. To top it off, he is completely annoyed by the tiny trio and complains incessantly about how they are cramping his style and the type of relationship he longs to have with his girlfriend. They were a burden on him and an interference with his party time. Maurice wanted all the attention from Amanda, and he couldn't get it, all the attention that he needed from her because the children were in the way. To show his disdain, he intimidates them when she's not at home. At least one occasion, he even admitted that he stuck their heads in an oven and pretended to turn the gas jets on. But he didn't, and that terrified the boys. Maurice 
had told Amanda that yeah, he was just horsing around with the kids. Put your head down! You don't need a PhD to figure out this is very abusive behavior. When the fathers of the kids confront her about Maurice's scary stunts, Amanda just sees them as part of his jokester ways. It pissed me off. Part of my language, it, it made me mad. And uh, she wouldn't do anything about it. I knew something wasn't right, so I was trying to get custody of my daughter. That summer, Maurice announces that he's ready to move back to his hometown of St. Louis, and he wants Amanda to come and continue their journey together. Amanda is thrilled, but there's just three problems. Why not my kids? Those kids are in the way, and they weren't his, and he just wanted he and Amanda to have the good time. No way could those kids come with them. While it seems like a strange request to make of a single mom, Amanda is desperate to have a fresh start in the big city with the man she loves, so she considers the proposition. Amanda responded by asking her mother if she could take custody of her children. Her mother told Amanda, I can take Christopher, but your younger ones need to be with you. You're their mother. I love my grandchildren. She scoffs at her mom's offer, but is now at a loss about how to make this move a reality. And allowing the fathers to take the kids is not an option. The kids' dad wanted something to do with their kids, and she wouldn't allow that. I told her, you know I'm trying to get custody of Kylie, and I know Christopher's dad would have taken him in a heartbeat. She kind of just shrugged it off and didn't really care. Because of her own anger with these fathers, she felt that if these guys didn't want her, then they couldn't be with their kids, period. By the end of the summer, Amanda hasn't found a solution, and Maurice is getting more and more fed up with the fact that this bothersome detail is holding them back. At this point, Amanda was very much in love with Maurice, and she would have done anything to keep that relationship going. The pressure is on to get their relocation plans underway, and Amanda is eager to please her man. But then, it's as if fate steps in. On a warm September evening, Amanda and Maurice decide to treat the kids to some quality time. They went to the diner there in Clinton, had dinner, and after they got done, Maurice wanted to take a drive out to the lake. When they arrive at Clinton Lake an hour later, a 5,000-acre reservoir known for fishing and water sports, Maurice parks nose first on the west side boat ramp about two feet from the water. While there, they got out and played for a little bit. After some fun by the shore, they all pile into the sedan, and the kids settle in for the ride home. Once everyone buckled in, instead of the car being backed up away from the lake, away from the water, it went forward towards the water. The children begin to panic as they realize what they thought was another one of Maurice's pranks is a very real situation. The car is being swept further away from the shore with the family trapped inside. Maurice and Amanda got out of the car um, as water was entering. The sedan sinks as they make their way to dry land. The fight response would have instructed her that I can save my children. That sense of urgency never really took place in the hearts of Maurice or Amanda. Christopher was up in the back ledge behind the back seat looking at her. And later, in Wilkesboro, North Carolina, 15-year-old April Barber will stop at nothing to be with her true love, even if it means setting her whole world on fire. It wasn't an option to walk away from the man that she believed she loved. If you want to talk about a 180 degree turn, that's when everything goes wrong. Clinton, Illinois single mom Amanda Ham and her boyfriend Maurice Legrone are sitting front and center as her car rolls into the town lake with them and their three children inside it. In the heat of the moment, the couple jump ship and wades to safety. The children weren't out of the car. They were drifting deeper and deeper into the water. On shore, Maurice holds Amanda and tells her there's nothing they can do. 
How could you sit there and look at your kids in the back window and them crying and beating on the window and not do anything? She's been so manipulated that she can't allow her maternal instinct to kick in. To watch her children being submerged into that water in that way, her judgment was clouded as to how quickly she should act. Only after the car is fully submerged does Amanda go to a payphone just yards away to dial 911. Dispatch sends police and ambulances racing to the scene. A couple of them went right on into the water. Got all three children out of there within two minutes and had them back up on the shore. The car was in only four feet of water. It didn't make any sense to investigators that both of them um, couldn't have just gone into the water and saved the children. Amanda watches as their limp bodies are handed to EMTs, who immediately begin CPR. Then, each of her babies is put into an ambulance headed for the hospital, not knowing whether they will live or die. Maurice explains to the officers that it was all a freak accident, but things just aren't adding up. According to Mr. Legron, he tried to back it up and rev it and back it up, but the more he did, the wheel spun, and eventually the car just floated on into the water. He said the electronic locks didn't work and therefore couldn't get the kids out, but the first responders stated that they had no problems opening up those doors, and there wasn't an issue with the locks. Amanda tearfully agrees with his story. Amanda went along with the story that it was an accident because in some ways, that's probably what she wanted to believe. Meanwhile, news of the children submerged in the car travels fast through close-knit Clinton, and friends and family converge at the medical center. I got a phone call, and it was Amanda screaming on the phone. Something happened, something happened. And I said, well, where in the hell are you at? She said, the hospital. Something happened to your daughter. Before I'd even seen Amanda, I seen Austin's dad come through the double doors. And I was like, they're OK, right? <laughs> they're OK. Tell me they're OK. And then I was like, no, no. And I felt this weakness in me. After trying to resuscitate both six-year-old Christopher and three-year-old Austin for nearly an hour and a half, Emergency room doctors pronounced the boys dead. The trauma was also too much for 23-month-old Kylie. I went in her room, and they brought her back in there, put her in my arms. She in my arms. And the doctor came out with the stethoscope, pronounced her dead in my arms. The deaths send shockwaves through the community, and Amanda checks herself into a psychiatric facility. And when detectives take a closer look at the scene of the drownings, they find that the couple's account of the ordeal doesn't make sense. They found absolutely nothing, no marks at all. No rubber had been peeled on the boat ramp. And they also checked Amanda's car tires. There was no indication that they had been spinning on a ridged surface. Three weeks after the incident, while she's being treated for severe depression and free of Maurice's influence, Amanda's version of events begins to change from that of an accident to something much more sinister. She told the police that was his plan, and she doesn't know why she went along with it, but she did, and she just wasn't strong enough to stand up to him. Amanda is discharged from the hospital two weeks later, but she has nowhere to go. Her mother didn't want to take her in because she didn't feel good about what happened with her grandchildren, believed that Amanda had more to do with it than what she was actually possibly telling. When she tries to reach Maurice, she finds he's moved back to St. Louis without telling her. Utterly alone, she takes up residence in a homeless shelter in neighboring Bloomington, gets a job waiting tables, and begins the arduous process of rebuilding her life. But investigators are building their case, and two months later, she gets the next surprise. The police arrived at the shelter and arrested her for nine counts of murder, three for each child. 
Maurice was apprehended in St. Louis, and he was charged with the same counts. Two and a half years after the drownings, Maurice is first up to face the judge, and his once loyal girlfriend is nowhere to be found. I thought the jury wanted to hear from the mother of the children who were dead, and uh, she just refused to go against her man. Maurice maintains innocence and described the entire event as an accident. Despite his apologetic testimony, he is convicted of first-degree murder with a sentence of life without parole. When it's her turn, Amanda doesn't testify, but her lawyers maintain that it was all a horrific series of unfortunate events. Amanda is found guilty of the lesser charge of child endangerment. The jury found that she participated in some fashion in the death in that she didn't do enough to stop their drowning that she didn't interfere. She is sentenced to 10 years in prison, the maximum allowed. But it's little comfort to the fathers of the children. It felt like a punch in the stomach. And I just fell to my knees and started crying. That's it? That's it? Amanda Hamm is released on parole 19 months later. And after two more years, she is let go from the system and is said to have paid for her crimes. But many in Clinton are not ready to forgive and forget. Post-jail, Amanda seems to have come to her senses, understands that she could have done much more in trying to save the lives of her children. It was clear that Amanda made a choice. And it wasn't a choice to be a mother and take care of her children. It was a choice to be with her man. She would go to extremes for a man. It's terrible, but that's what she did. Amanda's three little ones suffered the consequences of her bad choice in men. More than 500 miles away in Wilkesboro, North Carolina, April Barber will let her older boyfriend cloud her judgment and her family will be caught in the crossfire. Wilkesboro, North Carolina 14-year-old April has been forced to grow up faster than most girls her age. Her mother was in and out of jail for different petty crimes. Her father was in jail for manslaughter, so she really didn't have them to depend on. With her mom and dad out of the picture, her grandparents, Lily and Aaron Barber, step up to the plate and adopt her. Aaron was 83, Lily was 77. It's difficult enough to keep up with your own child when you're younger. It had to be extremely taxful for the grandparents to, to keep up with their granddaughter. But the Barbers have every intention of raising April as their own. They went to church every Sunday. They instilled education for April. It was a very strict environment. And I think the reason for that was the fact that they didn't want to see what happened to April's mother happen to her. And April seems to be responding. Her name consistently graces the honor roll. And she even joins a summer job training program at her high school. She wanted to work be able to obtain spending money for herself. And I think that's all part of maturity, part of accepting responsibilities. Things are looking up for the pretty teenager until she's on her way home from a training session. A passing man strikes up a friendly conversation. His name is Clinton Johnson. He was smooth talking, sort of gentleman, had a way to say the things that most young girls want. What was unusual about it is that April was 14, he was almost 30. Therein lies the problem. For her, as a young teen, this was exciting. He knew better. But obviously, this was not an issue for him. This is the first of many lines that Clinton and April will cross in the name of love. He was a very manipulative, seductive individual that preyed upon the needs and wants and desires of a child. And there's no turning back once she devotes her life to it. I think April will do anything for her man and get the future and the family she wanted. Fourteen-year-old April Barber is smitten by the charms of older man Clinton Johnson, who flirts with her outside her high school in Wilkesboro, North Carolina. 
He's almost 30, but that doesn't stop him from trying to seduce the child. There's a connection, there's an attraction. He made her feel beautiful, made her feel special. And for a girl of that age, just when you're coming into your womanhood, that is everything. Clinton was able to prey upon those desires, those wants, those needs, and he recognized it and he used it very well. The fellow Wilkesboro native is a carpenter and likes to work with his hands. And when he turns on the charisma, April quickly falls under his spell. While she does her best to follow her grandparents' rules, the aging couple doesn't have the energy to watch her every move. Word had gotten back to Aaron and Lily that April was dating a 29-year-old man, and they weren't happy with it. The two begin spending more time together, and as the summer comes to an end, they take their relationship to the next level. She's now in love. It was a full-out boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, including the physical aspects. They were intimate. We're talking about a 14-year-old being in a sexual relationship with a 29-year-old. So this is not about a mutual sexual relationship. This is about an adult male having sex with a child. She can't get enough of her new lover and tries to see him every moment she gets, even when she's supposed to be in school. Her grandparents, Lily and Aaron, are none the wiser that she is cutting class because she has help from an unlikely source, her mom. This one time her mother was out of prison, Clinton would provide a little bit of cash to her mother, and in turn, for that, she would sign a permission slip for April to be absent from school. April's mother could have been such a powerful influence on her daughter's life. Instead, she chose to enable this very dangerous liaison. Eight months go by, and April begins taking more risks with Clinton. And she suspects that all their running around has caught up with them. April was starting to feel some of the initial symptoms of pregnancy. She was happy that she was pregnant by this adult. Clinton was very excited about the child. He was welcoming the good news. Though she's experiencing the morning sickness that comes with being pregnant, 15-year-old April is too naive to imagine the challenges that come with raising a baby. She wanted to have what she didn't already have. So she had her man, now she was having his child. So to her, in a teenage romantic mentality, this was a beautiful thing. She wanted to keep it a secret from her grandparents, knowing that they would be devastated and upset about that. So she tried to hide it. But the teenager isn't able to shut down the gossip mill in close-knit Wilkesboro. They already had gone through this situation with April's mother, who had April when she was a teenager. So they didn't want this to repeat itself. When the youngster's nausea continues, her grandparents' suspicions come to the fore. The barbers are adults. They figured out that something was up with April. They confronted her about the pregnancy. Of course, this did not go over well. Now that her secret is out, April tells them she's having her baby. But her grandparents are having none of it. They gave her an ultimatum. They told her either she had to abort the child or they were going to have Clinton brought up on charges of statutory rape. April's mama bear instinct kicks in when faced with two impossible choices. The most important thing in her life was how can I make this work? How can I save my baby? How can I save my relationship with the man that I love? What do I do now? That same night, April breaks away to meet up with Clinton and break the bad news. And just like his younger girlfriend, He's furious that Lily and Aaron could be so callous. He really wanted this child that April was having and saw the grandparents as being impediments to this happiness. Backed against the wall, they come up with a plan. I don't actually think there was ever an option for them getting in a car, becoming a Bonnie and Clyde, and running away. Clinton was having sex with the minor. Police would follow him forever. In order for the couple to live there happily ever after, her grandparents will have hell to pay. April and Clinton knew if they were going to be together forever, the barbers could not be part of the picture. The plan was for them to enter the home, into the bedroom, and kill her grandparents.
15-year-old Wiltsboro, North Carolina mom-to-be, April Barber, is desperate to keep her baby and her man, 30-year-old Clinton Johnson, all in the face of her grandparents' threats to turn Clinton in for statutory rape unless she terminates the pregnancy. It wasn't an option to get an abortion. It wasn't an option to walk away from the man that she believed she loved. Devastation set in. The idea of helplessness set in. They knew they'd had no choice. They had to kill the grandparents. Together, the pair plots her grandparents' demise. April will swipe her grandfather's pistol and give it to Clinton, who will sneak into the house and gun down Lily and Aaron. In the meantime, April is going to be tucked away in her room, keeping busy and staying out of the way. By offering to get her grandparents' gun to shoot them speaks to how difficult this situation was for April and how she just wasn't thinking straight. This whole relationship had warped her mind. The couple seemed to have it all figured out. They will blame the shooting on a random robbery gone wrong. But guns are too messy, and the police will ultimately trace it back to them so they shelve that scheme. When the first plan didn't pan out the way they wanted to, April and Clinton came up with a second plan. This time, they would poison the barbers. The idea was to provide an insecticide that they would drink. But when Clinton finds a bottle of insecticide, they discover a hitch in their strategy. The insecticide had a really strong odor, and they felt that it may be detected by the barbers if they were eating something, the smell would come through. They ditched that plan before they even attempted it. They eventually come up with an idea that will make it seem like a tragic accident. A month after the blowout with her grandparents, Clinton brings over a milk jug filled with gasoline that April hides in her room, waiting for the right time to use it. It was a quiet Indian summer night, early September. The house is quiet as Lily and Aaron are preparing for bed. April sees the window of opportunity and makes her move. There's no time to wait for Clinton, who is at his home across town. She took this milk container and began to pour streams throughout the house. She sets the milk jug next to the sofa and pulls a lighter out of her back pocket. Then she took a piece of newspaper, lit it with the lighter, and then dropped it on the floor, and it ignited. In a flash, the flames travel through the house, setting everything in its path ablaze, including her cell phone. Although this was a terrifying act, April's focus was on her baby and her man. She takes the cordless telephone with her. She goes outside. Lily is the first to smell the smoke. Aaron is quickly overcome by the fumes. Once Lily realized that the house was on fire, she tried to get Aaron out, but she couldn't. She was 77, he's 83. It's not easy. She crawls through the fire to the first floor bedroom, determined to escape and get help. This had to be a nightmare for Lily. You can't help your elderly husband out. You have to leave him just to get help. And you're already covered with burns and thinking at the same time that April's in there, her baby. Lily was frantic as that fire was engulfing the house. Lily thought for sure she was going to die in that burning house. Outside, April is in shock over what she has done. The outcome, the aftermath, I don't think has set in. I don't really truly believe that she was thinking about the consequences. The accelerant had moved the fire rapidly within the matter of minutes. The whole home was engulfed. The flames rising from the house light up the neighborhood, and a pair of good Samaritans takes notice. They came over and they asked her why hadn't she called 911. She said that the phone wasn't working, that the fire had maybe destroyed the lines, so they offered to let her use their phone, which she did. It's really ironic that here, April helps to set the fire, but she also calls 911. She loved her grandparents, but it appears she loved Clinton and, of course, her baby even more. When she comes back to the scene, she finds a crowd gathered on the front lawn. She weaves through the chaos and can't believe her eyes. She sees that her grandmother has made it out of the house. Lily had found her way to a first floor bedroom window and crawled out of the window to get herself to safety.
After setting her grandparents' house ablaze with them in it, Wilkesboro, North Carolina pregnant teen April Barber is standing outside watching the drama. She's done the deed to stop Lillian Aaron Barber from meddling in her relationship with older boyfriend Clinton Johnson. April's focus was on her baby and her man. That's all she was thinking about. But Grandma Lily has managed to escape. She saw neighbors around her grandmother who had escaped the fire. The terrified woman cries for the loved ones she believes are still in the inferno. Aaron's inside, my baby's inside, save them. That was her concern, despite the fact that she had second degree burns on her body and had, had smoke inhalation. April had to be thinking, what now? I think that would have been the most devastating thing, finding that Lily made it out alive and what was to come. Grandma, I'm okay. Just then, fire trucks arrived with sirens blaring. When they went inside the house, they found Aaron face down, covered with blisters. He had succumbed to the fire, unfortunately, before they could get him out. Lily is placed in an ambulance and is rushed to the hospital. The distraction from the attempted rescue allows April to sneak away. Her next move was to use the phone to call her boyfriend, Clinton, and which time she told Clinton that the house was in a blaze, and Clinton said that he would be there immediately. Once Clinton arrived, he and April went over to the side and watched the fire. While they were standing there watching this house burn, it was sad and it was tragic. She's losing her grandparents. But at the same time, she was gaining the life that she wanted. After battling the deadly blaze, the fire chief begins asking witnesses if they have any more information about what happened that night. When a neighbor points to April, she is standing arm in arm with Clinton. The fire chief looked at April and what was suspicious to him is that she didn't look like she had been in the fire. That was of interest to him. Interest enough that he did the initial interview asking about the background, what had occurred, how she escaped, and so forth. April tells him that she was sitting in the living room watching TV when she saw a spark behind the set. She picked up the cordless telephone and ran out of the house with the idea that she was going to call the fire department without notifying her grandparents that the house was under fire. He gets the sense that something is not right with her story, and he vows quietly to tell investigators about the odd couple. Authorities take April to her next of kin, a great aunt who lives across town. Meanwhile, Clinton makes himself scarce and goes home to wait for April's call that their life as a budding family can finally begin. April and Clinton at that point felt that they had committed the perfect crime. At the scene, investigators discover some evidence that isn't jiving with the youngster's story. The first thing they found in the charred home was the smell of gasoline. In addition to this, they saw the poor pattern on the carpet. And to even further their hunches, they found a plastic milk jug next to the couch, which smelled of the fuel. This was not an accident. This was deliberate. So now the picture changes. Now you have something that isn't so benign that has now become a crime scene. Police delve deeper into April's account. At 3.30 a.m. that next morning, the sheriff's department made a visit to Aaron's sister's house to talk to April. Investigators found that April was very calm and collected for a 15-year-old, given what had happened. She was polite and all, but she wasn't very emotional after the fact that she went through a fire. But after several hours of grilling, April cracks under the pressure. As cold and calculating as this crime was, we have to remember she was still 15 years old. She was certainly no match against the detectives. She confessed to the whole story the plot of setting the fire, even to the role that her boyfriend Clinton played into setting the fire. After tracking him down, April Barber and Clinton Johnson are both booked on a slew of charges, including first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and arson. And another murder charge is added when Lily Barber passes away a week after the fire. Through it all, Clinton's not as loyal as April hopes. Although April had said that Clinton was involved in the crime, he said he only brought her the gasoline, that he had nothing to do with setting the fire. 
No matter his denials, Clinton is found guilty by a jury and sentenced to two consecutive life terms plus 30 years in prison. April pleads guilty and is slammed with two back-to-back -back life sentences of her own. While in prison, April gave birth to her son. He was then taken from her and raised by a friend in Greensboro. Her son has appeared to have grown up to be a good citizen, and he does visit his mother frequently. April has since expressed her remorse for the crime and calls what she did a stupid mistake made by a reckless teenager. She has spent her time in prison getting her education in hopes that she will receive clemency for taking responsibility for her grandparents' murder. April can't go back and change the past, but she can certainly show that the adult that she is now is miles apart of the child who was part of those horrific actions in the past. And the fact that this young lady didn't have the guidance, even though she was raised by her loving grandparents, but she was seduced by a predator. She lost her way. And for that, she may pay the rest of her life for those mistakes. I think people who are desperate for love will do anything to get it. And April is no exception. There was something she was looking for, and Clinton just happened to be the person who came along at the right time with the wrong answer. In Dallas, Texas, Tasha Dunnigan is willing to do whatever it takes to provide for her man. She came under the influence of this man, and he pushed her to become a prostitute. But when Tasha's fired, her boyfriend talks her into a risky plan of revenge. When she pulled her gun out and he immediately pulled his, that's when she started shooting. She had no idea that this was going to ruin her life. She wanted him to love her, so she would do whatever he wanted, no matter what he asked. And later, in Los Angeles, Nurse Connie Ikpo is known for her generous ways. Everybody she came in contact with seemed to think that her was being the perfect person. But Connie and her pastor husband aren't as angelic as they seem. This scheme was driven by unadulterated greed. To the minute she let Christopher in her life, she starts down this dark and narrow path. There are hundreds of thousands of women in prison at any given time in the U.S. These are the true stories of women who committed heinous crimes in the name of love. For my man. In Dallas, Texas, Tasha Dunnigan has lived a hard life. Tasha grew up poor without a lot of family support. Tasha did not graduate from high school. With a lack of education, it's not easy for Tasha to find steady work. For the next decade, she moves aimlessly from one low-paying position to another. She wasn't the type of person that could go out and get a job working as a secretary. Um, so in terms of options on making a living, she was really, really limited. It limits you because in this market, everybody, for the most part, employers are looking for qualified applicants that have a college degree or higher. By the age of 34, Tasha meets a handsome, smooth talker named Henry Sanchez, who sweeps her off her feet. Henry did not have a legal job. He was a low-level drug dealer, and at the time, he was primarily living off of Tasha. And to pay the bills, Tasha takes a job at a local 24-hour massage parlor. On the outside, it was a massage parlor. On the inside, it was a brothel. If there's a great opportunity, um, I think that you should at least take a shot at it. Henry convinced her that she could make more money than either of them could in any other job if she just started turning tricks. Tasha was a victim of Henry's control. This was a person who ruled with an iron fist. He was completely in charge. Whatever he wanted, she did. She just couldn't stand up to him. She really, really just wanted to make some money and make ends meet so that she can pay her bills and do what she needed to do. Despite the illicit nature of the job, it's the answer to all their money problems. What is that? 
She was making a lot of money every day. It's over a thousand, maybe over two thousand. And so she would bring that home and give that to Henry. I'm so proud of you. Imagine how much money you're gonna make in the next few weeks. When you live with someone who pressured you to become a prostitute, it beats you down. She loved him. And no matter how badly he treated her, she wanted him to love her. So she would try harder to do whatever he wanted, no matter what he asked. That's my girl. But after only a few months, Henry's gravy train comes to an abrupt halt when Tasha is suspected of pocketing some of the cash she was supposed to hand over to the business for herself. You do know I need to see all your money. That is on. No. The massage parlor's owner had a business of trust. That is mine. I clearly know what it isn't. He didn't want to give Tasha any chances. If he couldn't trust his employees, they were gone out the door right then and there. So she was fired two months after she started working there. It's a blow to Tasha, but she's more frightened by how Henry will react. She was really devastated and heartbroken because she was losing the ability to make as much money as she had been making, and she dreaded telling Henry about this. How are you? He saw her as a meal ticket. She was someone to send out into the world and say, go make some money and bring it home so I can have shelter and I can have food and I can be with you when I want to. What's going on? As suspected, Henry doesn't take the news well. They fired me. You gotta be kidding me. What did you do? Henry was in a fit of rage when he found out that she was fired. You have to fix this. You After have to all, you know, she used to make a lot of cash that she wasn't making anymore. What am I gonna do? I don't know. I need some time to think. With their primary source of income gone, Tasha and Henry are back to struggling to pay their bills. A few weeks after the dismissal, they're in dire straits. This is an eviction notice. Financial situation had gotten to a point where they were about to be evicted from their apartment. Pay the rent? Tasha didn't have any place to go. Henry didn't have any lost, place please. to go. They you were very desperate for money. You lost your job last so week, and I told you we got to do something about it. Did you go back? His anger life? built and built, and he decided he wanted to get even with the people who took Did away their means of support. No, it was my money. Well, maybe we should. No, we wouldn't do that. You Facing work, eviction, you Henry comes up with a plan that will solve all of their problems in one fell swoop. Henry has an idea that will get revenge on Tasha's boss and also get them the cash they so desperately needed. We gotta make this right. He's we going to hold up the money. massage parlor. It's your money. It's your work. Because of the nature of the business, a robbery would go unreported. Because it was such a cover for a prostitution house, they certainly thought that if something like this were to happen, they wouldn't call the police. You work there, you know that. What coupled with Tasha's first-hand knowledge of the operation will make it an easy score. Tasha knew the best time to go there. She also knew the layout of the building. She knew that they had no safe. And the way the money worked is the managers would keep the money in their pocket. But Tasha will need some convincing. Tasha said she didn't want to hurt anyone. He kept pushing her and pushing her and pushing her until she said yes. Tasha felt like she had to do what Henry wanted her to do. She wanted to please him, keep him happy. Two or three guys I've seen. Tasha tells him the place is like a fortress. You need an appointment and need to be buzzed in. The way that it works is that they knock on the door, an armed manager comes and escorts them inside. There, they find a girl that they would like to have the massage services with. And then once the service is completed, then payment is taken. The plan was for Tasha to show up. She knew that the door was going to be locked and tell them that she had lost her cell phone charger. And then once inside, she was supposed to go to the back of the building and open a back door for Henry. What about the gun? Once Henry is inside, he will demand that the night manager hand over all the night's cash earnings. He doesn't want to take any chances with the armed proprietor, so he asks his cousin to go along for the ride. So what's going on? He got his cousin involved so he could have one more gun with him. One more gun means more control over what's going to happen once they're inside. They would have the manpower to scare or perhaps overpower the one manager and make him give up the cash. That's the best way to go. We're going to get this, Tasha. It seems like the perfect plan, but Tasha's not so convinced. She felt compelled. She had no other choice. She was facing eviction. They had no money. Tasha hopes if she does exactly what Henry wants, nobody's going to get hurt. 
A few days later, the trio puts their plan into action. Tasha. At sunrise, Henry hands Tasha a 38 caliber gun to put in her purse, and they drive over to the massage parlor a few miles from their home. Robbing the place early in the morning also would have meant that the manager on duty would have had all the cash from their busiest time on hand. And since all their cash just went into the manager's pockets, at the end of that shift, it all would have just been sitting there, ripe for the picking. Once on scene, everyone moves into position. Tasha rings the bell at the front door. The manager looks out the window and sees Tasha at the door and lets her inside. Tasha doesn't miss a beat, even when she spots another girl at the desk. The only other person who was in the building when Tasha arrived is her friend Maria, who is another worker. And she had just come off her shift, and she was in the lobby area waiting for her ride. Did you need something? Yeah, actually, I think I left my charger here. Tasha says that she can't find her cell phone charger. She thinks it might be there somewhere. So could she please look around? And he yeah, says, sure. sure. Outside, Henry and Timothy stand by for Tasha to open the rear door. Inside, Tasha keeps the lost charger distraction going, so she works her way toward the back. But there's a problem. The night manager happened to look out a window, and he saw Henry and his cousin leaning up against the wall with their guns out like they were trying to hide. And that's when Henry's perfect plan begins to fall apart. And what happens next will send Tasha's world into a death spiral. What are you doing? Unlock it. They thought that this was going to be easy in, easy out. I think they thought that anything like this would happen. Henry was everything to her. She was willing to risk everything for him. The two of them together were double trouble. In Dallas, Texas, just a few months after 34-year-old Tasha Dunnigan is fired from her job at a massage parlor, she lets her boyfriend Henry Sanchez talk her into getting revenge via armed robbery. There were very strong elements of control and dominance in this relationship. And so if Tasha really wanted to stay with him, there were just certain rules that she had to abide by. So I think that it really took her down a wrong path. I don't know if she would have normally done had she not been with him and in this relationship. They're desperate for money, and in his mind, this is the perfect plan to come up with quick money. With their plan underway, Tasha waits for the right opportunity to let her boyfriend and his cousin, Timothy Johnson, inside. It might be in the bag. Yeah. Like there that. were no customers there at that time. It was just the manager and one of the girls that worked there. But out of the gate, Henry's plan starts to unravel. The night manager had noticed Henry and Timothy outside, so he was suspicious. Suspicious, the manager senses a security risk. And to protect Tasha, he takes her to the back door to let her out safely. He opens the back door and he looks down and he sees two guys coming toward him. The night manager quickly slams the door shut and locks it. When he turns around, he sees Tasha holding a gun to him. What are you doing? Unlock it. And he says, please don't do this. Is this what you wanted to do? And he begs her to back down and she does it. Instead, the night manager pulls out his own gun. Tasha was scared. Things weren't going the way they're supposed to. Tasha panicked once the manager refused to comply with her demand to open the back door. Henry was waiting for her to unlock the door, okay. and she was willing to do whatever it took to make that happen. Even if it means pulling the trigger. The manager is shot in the stomach, and he falls to the ground. At that point, Tasha runs away to let her accomplices in. Tasha is so rattled at this point because she doesn't know whether the manager is alive or dead. And so the only thing she can focus on is making sure that Henry and Timothy can get into the back door. And whatever she does, she wants to make sure that Henry's plan is met to the letter. Tasha, did you shoot him? Tasha's former co-worker, Maria, Damn. watches in horror as the horrific scene unfolds in front of her. She's hysterical. Where's the money, man? You know, she's really upset. She has no idea what was happening, and she now is a witness. Where's the money, man? Come on. We're not joking, man. The manager is wounded but still alive and takes cover. I don't know where the money is. 
he retreated to behind a counter that was there in the business, kind of used as a shield for himself. Come on, man, just give us the money. With money me. on their mind, the robbers stick to the plan. Henry and Timothy approach the manager and ask for the money. I don't know where the money is. And the manager says, no. And they start a shootout. When the bullets start flying, Maria cowers in fear. So she was a liability. Timothy takes her into another room where he shoots her in the stomach. Tasha's worst fears are coming true. Tasha must have been scared out of her wits. She had so many things coming down on her. Meanwhile, the gunfight between Henry and the manager spins out of control, and Henry is hit in the leg. The would-be robbers have no choice but to retreat empty-handed. The whole plan had gone south. Henry was shot. He was bleeding profusely. Still hidden behind the counter, the night manager calls 911. I don't think they're expecting the night manager to defend himself or defend the business as ferociously as he did. Drive, drive. Timothy and Tasha get Henry back to the car. We gotta get him to the hospital. No hospital, no. Gotta... Tasha gets behind the wheel, but tries desperately to keep her wits about her. The one thing she was really scared of came true. People got hurt. The manager was shot. Her coworker Maria was shot, and now her partner, her significant other Henry, was shot. With Henry bleeding out, Tasha can barely keep the car on the road. So they realized that Henry's condition was life-threatening and it wasn't as easy as just running away. They had to seek medical assistance. Tasha finds herself in a no-win situation. No. Yes! No, no, hospital. We have to go! No. Henry needs medical help. He's been shot in the leg, but at the same time, they need to hide from the police. So Tasha has a decision to make. Is this about her own safety and Henry not getting the medical attention or getting Henry to a doctor or an emergency room at the peril of being caught? This was not supposed to happen. You gotta get to the hospital. Man, do not go to the hospital. He thought it would be an easy in and out job. Tasha did all of this in the end for the love of her man. And later in Los Angeles, Connie Ikpo's man will give her a taste of the good life by having her make a deal with the devil. I love her. So the minute she let Christopher in her life, she starts down this dark and narrow path. This is a shell game and Connie's an active participant. In fact, she's just all in. Tasha Dunnigan has to choose between saving her boyfriend's life or getting away after a botched revenge robbery attempt in Dallas, Texas. No hospital! This was not supposed to happen! You gotta get to the hospital! Against her accomplice Timothy's objections, Tasha drives straight to the emergency room. Tasha wanted to save Henry no matter what the risk. If Tasha didn't care about Henry, she could have just taken him home and said, we'll try to get the bullet out. I told you not to come here, Tasha. We had to come! Oh, just, just leave. Go somewhere else. Nurse, please! Please, no. When they get to the hospital and pull over, Timothy flees. He runs. That's when she realizes she's on her own. Okay, Timothy knew that once they got to the hospital, the hospital would call the police to report a gunshot victim. Doctor, please help but Tasha me. doesn't care. Tasha's emotional state at that point was primarily focused on uh, getting Henry to the hospital and trying to make sure he doesn't die there in the car. No, please help Tasha me. loved Henry, and she did everything for him, and he's the reason that she did this. So she wasn't going to let him die, but she also risked her life by deciding to save him. Somebody tried to carjack us. To cover their tracks, she lies to the hospital staff, saying they're the victims of a carjacking. She's a survivor, so she comes up with an explanation as to what happened. But what Tasha doesn't know is that the night manager at the massage parlor has survived, and he's called 911. When the police arrive, they find Maria dead. The manager was able to identify Tasha and tell them exactly what happened. Yeah, I locked the door. The manager is able to give the police her name and the description of the two men. This description is almost identical to the report the hospital has already provided the authorities. Henry has a gunshot wound, and it's hospital's protocol that when something like that happens, they automatically have to notify the police department. 
At the crime scene, they get a report of three people showing up at the hospital, one of them with a serious gunshot wound, and they put two and two together pretty quickly. By the time Henry is wheeled into surgery, Tasha is already in custody. She chose to stay with Henry at the hospital. She knew they were probably going to get caught. I think that also kind of shows how deep her involvement with him was. Tasha's whole world comes crumbling down on her because she doesn't know whether Henry's going to make it. Why would you tell me the truth? Under interrogation, Tasha stands her ground. My car. Tasha tries her best to stick to the carjacking story, but there's too many holes in the story. I don't know. We were carjacked. But the news of Maria's passing definitely hits a nerve. Maria's dead, and Tasha doesn't know whether she's going to prison for this. So Tasha's got to be devastated. Tasha was very remorseful about uh, Maria getting killed. In fact, Tasha uh, had talked about how good a friend Maria had been to her during the time that she worked there. And police have one more ace up their sleeve. When a police officer tells Tasha that the night manager identified her as the woman involved in the robbery, she breaks down. Make sure the scene of the crime. No. Maybe I was there. You know this happened. After hours of questioning, Tasha finally admits to shooting the night manager at the massage parlor. He drew a gun on me. But claims that he drew his gun on her first. She admitted to shooting him, but she said that she did it in self-defense. And when push comes to shove, Tasha finally turns on her man. This is all Henry's fault. She points the blame on Henry because it was his idea, and it, he was the one who really started all of this. He was the one that convinced her of what happened and convinced her that they needed to seek revenge. And so she really blamed everything on him. Like the night manager, Henry Sanchez survives his wounds and is arrested promptly after he is in stable condition. Two days later, police tracked down Timothy Johnson hiding out in a Dallas motel. The police had gotten a tip from someone on where he was, and that's where they found him. A year after the robbery, a Dallas jury convicts Tasha Dunnigan of capital murder. She's handed down a tough punishment. Life in prison without parole. Her boyfriend, Henry Sanchez, and his cousin, Timothy Johnson, each get the same. This was really about her relationship with Henry. Under other circumstances, I don't know if she would have done this on her own. So she really did it all for him. Tasha felt like she had to do what Henry uh, wanted her to do. She wanted to please him, keep him happy. And uh, he was just a very bad influence on her. So many women get involved in bad situations. They do things for what they think is love, and they ruin other people's lives, and they ruin their own lives. Prison has a way of allowing people to think. I mean, after all, you have nothing but time on your hands. And I walked to the back. He walked with me. She was now far removed from that very domineering, dominating relationship that she was in with Henry. So she finally does come to the proper realization that he led her down a path of danger and a really screwed up life. Trying to keep her boyfriend happy with a fistful of cash destroyed Tasha Dunnigan's life. In Los Angeles, Connie Ikpo is all about getting money for nothing in the name of everlasting love. Even from a young age, Connie seemed destined to be an overachiever. Connie was raised in Nigeria, a very hardworking single parent mother who raised her kids to be um, very hardworking. They were very pressed on getting an education, which they all seemed to do. By her early 20s, Connie becomes a nurse in Nigeria, helping those in need. She was industrious. She was well-liked. She was a hard worker. A decade later, Connie yearns for more. And during a fateful trip to America, she decides to take a leap of faith in Houston, Texas. She came to visit a cousin of hers who was living there, and she got interest in wanting to stay, enrolling in the university there. The 35-year-old immediately gets to work, building a whole new life for herself by continuing her education in the healthcare field. She was uh, confident, she was responsible. 
She was in school for something all the time, whether it was a bachelor's degree, which she needed to get here in the United States, or her master's degree, which she did complete. Connie is like a lot of immigrants who come to this country. Uh, they come for a better opportunity. She knows what she wants. She knows what she has to do, even if it means working harder than her peers. But Connie's also determined to enjoy her new life by spending time with friends and relatives. And it's during one of these gatherings where Connie is introduced to a fellow Nigerian who's in town visiting from California. Connie! Christopher was a Nigerian citizen, migrated to the United States, seemed to be somewhat successful in the hair salon business in Los Angeles. The two instantly bond over their mutual desire to help those less fortunate. They both were in the same community circles. He was doing volunteer work, which certainly appealed to Connie's nurturing caregiving side. Is this when you were in Nigeria? In Nigeria. Connie's attracted to Christopher primarily because they share the same culture. They both come from Nigeria. He's been in the States uh, longer than she has, so he's already started working and making something of himself. He's achieved some success. And for her, this is the ideal guy. This is a man who is ambitious just like she is. Shortly after their first meeting, Christopher returns to L.A., but the distance only makes their love grow stronger. They had a long distance telephonic relationship for a number of months and other subsequent visits. Finally, she moved to Los Angeles and they moved in together. He immediately proposes. They go back to Nigeria to be married and they come back to LA to begin their lives. Connie quickly settles into her new life with Christopher. She takes a job as a nurse and Christopher continues to run his successful hair salons. But the couple isn't satisfied with just achieving their own personal success. They want to make a difference in the world. Christopher and Connie were already very well respected in their communities. And Christopher already knows how he wants to give back. He tells Connie he wants them to become ordained ministers and open a storefront church. They convert one of the salons into their church. Connie likes the idea of becoming a pastor. People call them Pastor Chris and Pastor Connie, and the name of their church was Arms of Grace Church. But when Connie puts her faith in her man over God, her sins will destroy her life forever. Christopher and Connie are not the angels that they thought they were. And their church will become the perfect cover for a million-dollar bamboozle for which Satan himself would be proud. The scheme was driven by unadulterated greed. Nigerian immigrant Connie Ikpo is living the American dream in Los Angeles, California. Not only has she married the love of her life, Christopher Iruke, but her husband is determined to share their good fortune through a storefront ministry. It was a church that opened its arms up to a, a community that was in need, a community that looked like people that were coming from that part of the third world, coming from Africa, coming from Latin America, looking for a church home. And Connie works around the clock to make sure nothing in her life falls through the cracks. Connie was busy doing everything. She's busy at work. Um, she's busy with the church, doing food drives. She's trying to do it all. There's a part of Connie who wants to prove to Christopher that she can do the hard work. So she's doing everything that she can to get this church up and going. Because at the end of the day, she really wants to please him. Two years after the church opens its doors, the pews are packed. God is good, not just Sunday, God is good. And the couple adds All to their the responsibilities by bringing a new addition into the family. Connie and Christopher had a girl that they adopted from Nigeria. They're both working, they have the church, and on top of that, they're trying to raise a child. And they're making it all look easy. So easy that Christopher decides to start a ministry to serve those with disabilities, a healthcare company named Pascon. The medical supply company that Christopher opens actually provides medical supplies to folks that need them. It's the same community which their church serves as well. For Christopher, it's synergy. With his skilled wife at his side, Christopher is confident that Pascon will be a success. 
There's a lot going on in Connie's life and certainly a lot on her plate. She does want to help the community, but even more importantly, she wants to help her man. She wants to help Christopher reach his vision. Their main customers are Medicare beneficiaries. Medicare is typically for those that are of low or below income and that do not have medical insurance or over the age of 65. At first, the business seems to stall. Any new business typically will have a slow start because you're brand new, no one knows you're there. But then as word gets out, the customers begin to trickle in. And the company's biggest ticket item is a powered wheelchair with a hefty $6,000 price tag. If I was a member of the community and I had medical insurance, I could go to Connie or Chris and say that I have been prescribed to have a wheelchair. And um, can you get that for me? Now, to need a power wheelchair, um, you need to have serious medical conditions. It needs to be based on the prescription of a doctor who thinks that you need it. To capitalize on their most profitable item, Christopher starts purchasing large quantities of these wheelchairs at wholesale prices. They get a wheelchair for $1,000 wholesale. They pay another $1,000, and then Medicaid reimburses them $6,000 for the actual chair itself, and they end up pocketing the remainder of that money. <laughs> All right. I'll see you soon. All right. And Christopher starts seeing a profit of thousands of dollars a wheelchair. In fact, the venture is doing so well that Christopher wants to open a second company. And he wants Connie at its helm as sole owner and CEO. Connie opened up the second company called Horizon, which did the same exact business. She was the 100% owner, the manager, the operator of it. And between the two companies, over the next year, the money starts rolling in. They bought a nice house in a very nice neighborhood in Los Angeles. They both drove nice Mercedes. They sent money overseas to buy real estate. It is the American dream. So everything seems to be going just the way they want it to go. You go from going to work every day as a nurse to becoming a millionaire very drastic lifestyle change. Connie couldn't be happier with their newfound fortune. But behind their success, the couple is hiding a dirty little secret. As it turns out, it's all a scam. They are committing a fraud. Christopher has figured out how to make that money, and Connie's gotten a taste of the good life, and now she is hooked. So now she is going to follow her husband's lead. Can investigators bring their ride on Easy Street to a dead end before they cover their tracks? Los Angeles church leaders Connie Ikpo and Christopher Iruke live the good life after opening two successful medical supply companies. They provide in mobile wheelchairs and they would submit those claims to Medicare. For each wheelchair, they're making $4,000. Over time, this is millions of dollars. And it looks to everyone as they're building an empire. But what these angelic entrepreneurs have really built is a house of lies. They are committing a fraud. They are selling wheelchairs to people who just don't need them. It was a get-rich scheme by ripping off Medicare, which operates on the honor system and is vulnerable to disreputable people. While they keep up their appearances at their church, they no longer keep up the facade of the medical supply company. It was a, a medical supply company that had uh, you know, no walk-in clients, um, you know, no cash register, uh, you know, not the type of thing that you would expect to see if uh, they had a legitimate business supplying medical supplies to the public. It's a complicated scheme that works in two demographics. First, the couple lies to potential patients, conning them into buying wheelchairs that they don't need. They would tell um, community members that Medicare was going bankrupt, and so that they would not be able to meet their, their immediate medical needs, and they may want to go ahead and buy a wheelchair now. Some patients did receive the wheelchair. When you would go to their house to look at it, it would typically be parked in the garage or a corner of the house, uh, collecting dust and never having been used. And if their targets can't be persuaded to actually purchase a chair, 
they pay them for their personal information. A lot of times they would also, um, just in exchange for their name and social security number, buy them things that they needed. Even worse, they're taking advantage of the same group of people they claim to be helping, poor immigrants, many of which are members of their own congregation. There's a number of things that made them so easy to convince. There was a language barrier. They're immigrants. They're not really familiar with how processes work. They're pastors in the church, and that they're from a vulnerable population. Someone that is very respected in your community asks you, then of course you're going to comply. In phase two, Christopher buys up bogus prescriptions from shady doctors to submit to Medicare. Doctors are being paid who are signing off on these false prescriptions. Once people start getting large amounts of money from Medicare just by filling out some fraudulent paperwork and delivering wheelchairs, it's a lot of money really quickly, and um, it's hard to stop. It's great and it isn't just Christopher getting his hands dirty. Connie is supporting her man's illegal deeds every step of the way. She was just as involved submitting the documents that she needed, which means that she's fully aware that she's paying a middle person for the prescription. In Connie's mind, she can justify what's going on with this illegal activity. They're sending money back to family in Nigeria, and they're making a difference in their community. Over the next three years, the couple continues to preach about sin, but commit it on a regular basis. And it's their blatant disregard for appearances that finally puts their medical supply businesses on investigators' radar. As you dig into some of these companies, indicators of fraud become apparent. For example, a company that's only delivering one type of equipment, as in this case, the most expensive possible equipment, power wheelchairs, and not delivering you know, manual wheelchairs, canes, uh, walkers, other types of things that you would expect to see a legitimate company to supply. They were finding trouble with the billings, and they were questioning the necessity of the wheelchairs that they were being delivered. The investigators begin looking for proof, prescriptions, that all of these wheelchairs are attached to people who truly need them. With investigators hot on their heels, Connie and Christopher will stop at nothing to protect their lavish lifestyle. It was too late now for Connie to back out. She was now entangled in a web of lies. I don't think she was willing to get caught. Pastors Connie Ikpo and Christopher Iruke's Medicare scam has made them millions of dollars. And the couple is desperate to keep living the dream in Los Angeles. Chris, Iruke, and Connie Ikpo were greedy, and they wanted to get as much money as possible. And they weren't going to let the Medicare rules and regulations or anything else get in their way. Connie's got a lot to lose. She's worked so hard for everything, and she's afraid of losing all of that. But more importantly, she's afraid of losing Christopher. And that's why she's gone along with that scam. Look, we gotta do something to help ourselves. Alerted that Medicare officials are on the lookout for them, Connie and Christopher try to stay one step ahead of investigators. They begin to now understand that they are really being scrutinized and that they now are going to have to begin to do some things to keep themselves out of jail. Panicked, the couple closes the businesses in an attempt to throw investigators off their trail. But they aren't about to turn their back on their millions. After shutting down Pascon and Horizon, Christopher opens up two new stores and just picks up where he left off. They know that they can't put the new companies in their names so they cover their tracks and recruit others into their scheme. They use two names from members of parishioners of their church. They open a new storefront and get back to business as usual. It's a cat and mouse game. They're trying to avoid getting caught, and they do that by operating under different ownership. Medicare would have no way of knowing, based on the paperwork, that these were all Christopher Aruke and Connie Igpo's company. They would appear to be other people's companies who don't have the same issues. And that, again, is another, another scam. Connie really should put her foot down, but instead, she's just going to blindly follow along with this scheme. For the next six months, the plan seems to work, until Christopher gets a call from one of his employees. An investigator shows up to the medical supply store um, asking for Chris. Um, of course, the folks that are there um, give him you know, no information whatsoever but do get word to Chris that there is an investigator that's looking for him. 
Christopher calls an emergency meeting with their co-conspirators in a park down the street from his house. He's got to figure out how to cover their tracks. What I do know is that we're in this together. They give them instructions about not to talk to the police. They give them what we would call throw phones. They come up with code words. Christopher orders everyone to use their untraceable phones and not to tell police. But what he isn't aware of is investigators have been digging into the couple's lies. Myself and the agents would go interview some of these beneficiaries who bought wheelchairs and they would do jumping jacks for us. And so these aren't the types of people that need the power wheelchairs. A week later, investigators prepare to strike. And Connie and Christopher realize the clock is running out. So they try to erase any evidence connecting them to the scam. At some point, the medical records were all moved into the church. Connie spearheads the shredding party. She gathers prisoners and pays them to begin shredding files. If they get caught, not only is she going to lose this lifestyle that she's become accustomed to, but she's going to lose her man. And that's something that is not on the table for her. But the feds are waiting. After months of watching them, with a search warrant, they raid the church. And they seized all the records, including the shredded documents. Finally, Connie Ikpo and Christopher Iruke are arrested and charged with Medicare fraud. Connie and Chris have never admitted to their crimes. They both have maintained their innocence. Six months after her arrest, Connie is convicted of conspiracy to commit fraud and sentenced to three years in prison. Christopher is also convicted of conspiracy to commit fraud and 17 counts of health care fraud. He's sentenced to 15 years in prison. They both are responsible for 6.7 million, I believe, to reimburse the government. Connie took a vow to honor her husband for richer and for poorer, and she took that oath very seriously. Christopher is the one that led her down this path. He introduced her to the business of uh, Medicare fraud, and I don't think she would have thought of this on her own. Everybody loved Connie. So obviously this would be a grave shock to the community that she supported for so long. She certainly at any time could have stopped. She could have shut the whole thing down, but she chose not to. I think the true victims are, unfortunately, the, the community members of their church and the government.